Since uh, the late 1960s, Susan Hiller has infused conceptual and minimalist strategies and aesthetics with the influence of feminism, popular culture and psychoanalysis, creating works in a diverse range of media, notably sculpture, performance, video, photography, drawing and installation. Susan's work is represented in public collections around the world and she has had numerous important exhibitions in major institutions. Nicholas Sorota described her as a hugely influential figure for a younger generation of British artists. I would certainly agree with that, as I've found Susan's work inspiring and significant in relation to my own practice. It's such a privilege to be able to speak to her today. She's one of my all-time favourite artists. <laughs> <laughs> The feelings shared by many of you here, I've got great response from my request to students to provide the questions for our conversation today, and I'll be asking as many of these questions as I can, which I've compiled and structured into some kind of order. In doing this, for the benefit of the students who may have missed a Tate exhibition last year, or are less familiar with Susan's work, I've tried to put together a good overview of Susan's practice as much as can be done in the space of under an hour with such a broad and ex extensive oeuvre. To start off with, as this is an audience of students and practitioners, I thought it would be interesting to ask if you remember at what point you wanted to become an artist and why you made that decision. I wish I could, uh, I have to apologize, I'm very bad at giving short answers, this is not a short answer. I always wanted to be an artist, I think, I don't know what I thought an artist was, but I was always involved in drawing table in my room when I was a kid um, but it gradually dawned on me and I know this is going to sound different than the experience you're having but that there were no I was a girl there were no women artists I mean this is basically the opinion I had and then when I got older and people started mentioning women artists to me they always said um, something like oh but she's married to so and so and he's been her main influence or oh, she's an abstract painter, but she's really not a very good one. I mean, there was always some little denigrating, can you hear me? Yeah, some denigrating remark attached. It's just gone off there. I think I better, yes. Anyway, so I was discouraged. And that reminds me of a friend of mine who some of you will be familiar with because she's a very well-known artist, Carolee Schneeman, a performance artist, and she said that she always wanted to be an artist because she knew that the most famous artist in the world was a woman. And I said, well, who is that? And she said, Cezanne, because when she was a girl, <laughs> she thought that Cezanne was like Marianne or Luann or something. So she said, of course, the most famous artist had to be a woman, so she felt she had no problem about it, but I... I felt discouraged. And um, <laughs> then in my secondary school, they had a careers office, and I was browsing in there one day, and there was a booklet that I picked up, and it was by Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead was a very, very famous woman anthropologist. She was extremely famous when I was growing up in the United States. She was advising the government and so forth. Plus, she was writing bestsellers because she wrote books with names like Sex and Temperament in Three Primitive Societies. All her books had sex in the title. So, it's so pretty, pretty interesting you could reading. find them, you know, with other paperbacks in sort of stationary stores and things like that. So I thought anthropology was for me. And of course, it is an absolutely fascinating field. And I'm not sorry at all that I studied anthropology. I thought it was wonderful. But at a certain point, it just didn't suit me anymore. And I was going to lectures, and I discovered that instead of taking notes on the lectures, I was drawing pictures. And so I realized that I had to go back to my original plan. So then for a year or two, I took random selection of not exactly art courses, but I studied printmaking with um, William Hader, who's quite a famous printmaker, and I took a course in the history of film, and I took a practical photography course. I sort of picked so courses. You, you constructed your own art yes, education? That, well, I tried to. I tried to. But what I missed, because I don't think artists need to go to art school, but what I missed was the sense of uh, 
a generational community, yes. which I think is actually one of the most important things that you gain from our school. I don't know if you agree with that. Yes, but, I do, yeah. um, People who will always be not only your supporters, but your best, most honest critics. Yeah. Yeah. Long story. Yeah. But so your early works were paintings? Yes, because I thought a real artist was a painter. I mean, I was absolutely convinced about that. So um, I've, we'll launch straight into a student's question. Some, some old who's studying painting said, um, I'm most interested in your p painting blocks and relics, which are ongoing pieces. I want to know about the transformation of a something whole, like a painting, into a painting block. I feel as though it's definitely not about destruction, but reformation, looking at the same mass in a different way. I wonder what you discovered from the action of reforming these things, um, especially as she's doing something like that with her own practice. Really, right really. Now. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting set of questions, and again, difficult to answer briefly. I think the process of making the paintings into the painting blocks which is, of course, a pun, because you know, it's like a painting block, something that stops you from painting, but on the other hand, it is a block. So it's turning painting into sculpture, in another sense, turning surface into mass. But it was a transformational process for me, because I had this idea that um, things are always changing and moving on in some way, and that it would be interesting and, for me, important to to, to speed that up, in a sense. And I like to think of, um, you know, insects that have different life phases or, or creatures like um, frogs, which, you know, are tadpoles and then they become frogs, uh, caterpillars that become butterflies, et cetera, et cetera. So this, it's, not a just, it's not intended as a destructive process. It's a transformative one. Did I answer? Yeah, which yeah. I think is what she, she picked yeah. up on as well. Um, and she also asked how important... Um, are the remnants and remainders to you? And if they are important, in what way are they important? And, <laughs> and do you feel that over time these remains have changed in their meaning to you and perhaps in their meaning to the viewer of contemporary art? Well, I, the last part of the question, I have no idea what viewers think. And it, it, I, I think this is so, so confusing for artists. We're always asked to interpret our own work, but we can't interpret our own work. We can only talk about our intentions for our own work. So I don't know what viewers think of it. But I actually like them in the form that they're in. And in some cases, not with these, but with, with paper works, um, I've taken them even further. But there's not much I can do to these other than burn them. And I've already burned a lot of paintings. Um, so they're resting in their temporary state for a while. So would you burn the blocks? Like, do you, I, have, I do you have a criteria for mm -hmm. which ones would become blocks and which ones you'd set fire to? Well, the blocks were all from one series, and yes, it was sensible from my point of view. These are all burned works um, to do that because the paintings had been very minimalist that were working off grids and rectangles. And the paintings... Let me see if I can remember this. The paintings were things like uh, the red... red painting like um, blue rectangles onto a rectangular canvas and landscape shapes onto landscape or landscape onto portrait or portrait onto landscape, all these kinds of permutations that I was doing very um, conscientiously and using the most minimal means that I could think of. So those made sense to turn into other rectangular things. And the blocks themselves keep exactly the proportions of the original work. That's can we go back to the block? The block. It has um, has a size on it. Can you see that? I think that one's thirty six by fifty four. Yeah, inches. that was yeah. that's its yeah. name. That was the and original. The and two dates on there. Yeah, the f date of the painting and the date of the block. So, but the to the top numbers are the size of the original, so the proportion has been kept. Yeah. So okay, so this all part. That's that's very sensible. With mm. is that, you know, you can see the progression to the block, I think. So I don't know what the next phase would be. Well, with the burning? No, I don't think so. I don't think I would burn these. But who knows? If I can think of a reason. But no, I don't think so, really. I, I think this is, mm. it suggests the idea enough, sufficiently. Yeah. And the criteria for why, why you would burn certain paintings? Um, 
Well, the ones, the burned ones, can we go to the second one that you, the one with the long, yeah. Can, do you have a close-up of that? Unfortunately not. Uh, no. no, but those are all glass um, measuring tubes filled with ashes, and they're dated by year because every year I burn a painting, and they fill or not, as the case may be, uh, the tube. And mm -hmm. so this is about measuring. Um, Measuring the value of something, really. I mean, oh, let me put this. certainly not the financial value, but, but what you might call the value of the work to me. To see, to measure the value of it as ashes in relationship to value of it as an object. Because the interesting thing from my point of view is that, of course, the images of all those paintings are still in my mind. You can't destroy image in that sense. But this is a long, complicated argument. We can go into it again later yeah. if we want to. Okay. But, well, uh, we can, yeah. we can um, talk maybe now about the, the Sisters of Menon uh, work, which I think, for me, I, I kind of pick up on a reference to painting with the way that you articulate these, um, these uh, automatic writings in, in this kind of cross formation. Mm. Um, so, you know, kind of minimalist painting. Well, yeah, this is still back, back very early days. I mean, possibly before some of the people in this room were born. But this was, um, let me just talk about the formal side of it. This shape came about, from, again, for two reasons. One, because there is a cross shape at one point in the automatic writing. And another reason, when I had all these pieces of paper and I was looking at them thinking, well, how could I give them a shape in time? I didn't want to just pin them on the wall like loose pieces of paper, which I had been doing at that time with other kinds of work, but I wanted to distinguish this in some way. Um, and when I arranged all those pieces of paper, I realized they made this shape. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite simple, and that's perfect for the relationship with the work, yeah. with the, the text part of the work, yeah. Yeah, a couple of students asked specifically about this work and about your experience of automatic writing um, and how it came about and whether you ex experienced the same thing again or have made other works using that method. Um, so actually maybe it could be quite useful to talk about what automatic writing is. Yeah, I think so. This is really jumping around a lot. It's quite difficult for me. So do ask me if I'm leaving out any bits. Um, yes, automatic writing is uh, something that came into being in the 19th century as a practice among spiritualists. Spiritualism is a form of religion in which, uh, a form of Christianity in which people believe that they can communicate with the spirits of the dead through various means. One means is through writing automatically, that is by giving up vo volition, by giving up will and simply letting things flow through you. It has a lot to do with the older ideas of inspiration and so forth. Um, but it was a very particular kind of practice at one point, actually practiced mainly by women, um, interestingly enough. The surrealists took this up. The surrealists were extremely interested in ways of bypassing the intellect and bypassing the ego and they played around a great deal with automatic writing. Um, it's, some, it's, it's odd for, to talk about it in that way with artists because, of course, when you draw, um, if, if you're doing a drawing normally, you're not conscious of what the next mark will be so that one mark develops from another mark develops from another mark unless you're doing a very carefully plotted sort of technical drawing. And it's like that. You simply let your hand move. Now, it's associated in some people's minds with um, you know, all sorts of mysterious trance states and things of that sort. But I think that to, to go down that road when you're thinking about automatic writing is to do what Walter Benjamin said, which was to privilege the mysterious side of the mysterious instead of just accepting it as a possibility, an everyday normal possibility. I don't know, did any of you ever read a book called Drawing on the, this is the left side or the right, the right side of the brain? It's about drawing automatically. It's a practice for people who want to learn how to draw. And abstract expressionism as a painting practice 
could be seen as an extension of surrealism because they took up the surrealist idea of automatism, automatic drawing, automatic painting, and developed it into what we now think of as abstract expressionist painting or abstract expressionist mark making. Yes, I'm sure you're all familiar with a lot of this history. So my first experience of automatic writing was completely spontaneous and took me totally by surprise. Um, and once, I, <clears throat> my, I, as I've said about it, it seemed that this pencil had a mind of its own and it was just kind of marching across the page during this strange handwriting, which had nothing to do with my normal handwriting. And were you an anticipating writing? Or no, you could no. a drawing equally of kind of... Well, it started itself. off as some drawing. There's some sort of scribbles up in the top corner of the first page, yeah, which looks just shapes or something. Here, but that's the only detail we've got. Um, and then it sort of uh, became some marks, that, like practice marks, and then it turned into words. Um, and um, of course, it was both fascinating and boring to do it. <laughs> Well, fascinating because I was just amazed at watching my hand <laughs> do, and boring because I wasn't very involved. You know, it wasn't. <laughs> no, I'm. You know, I'm being serious about this. But it's very interesting to try to do, and it's not difficult. And I'll explain a very quick method if you're interested in trying this, because I I know that some people are always interested in it. Try watching television with a paper and pencil ready, and use your left hand if you're right-handed, or your right hand if you're left-handed, and just put the pencil over the piece of paper and see what happens. And don't pay attention. It's about divided attention, it really what it's about. Um, and it's something that's interested me and continued to interest me, and yes, I have done other automatic writing pieces, and then I did this piece. Yeah, and... Uh, recently, very recently. Yes, um, Jamie Lowes asked about this work. He, he um, asked if you could speak about the reasons why you made it. Yeah, this is a, one of my homage series to famous modernist artists. And this is a homage to Gertrude Stein. Gertrude Stein, a very famous um, American writer. I think probably some of you who are interested in in uh, modern writing will we'll know uh, about her work. Um, Gertrude Stein, um, in fact, there's a huge exhibition on in Paris where I've just been, uh, the art collection of Gertrude Stein and her brother Leo. Uh, Gertrude Stein was a friend of Ernest Hemingway's and all the artists who were living in Paris between the wars and so forth. And, um, Interestingly enough, she had started off not as a writer, not as anyone who intended to write, but as a student of psychology. And she studied with the very famous um, early psychologist, um, William James. Some of you may know his book, um, The v Varieties of Spiritual Experience, which ends with a long chapter on nitric acid, which he discovered spontaneously at the dentist and had mystical visions. Anyway, it's a fantastic and fascinating book uh, about altered states of consciousness. It's well worth looking at, an early, early, early book on those subjects. And she had been his student, and she had to do a BA paper, and she set up an experiment about divided attention um, in which people were practicing automatic writing. And that's interesting because it was around the turn of the century, and that's when all the spiritualist um, attention was happening. But like the Surrealists, she got rid of the religious or, if you like, superstitious element of uh, spiritualism and just took up the practice of automatic writing, just as the Surrealists did and later the abstract expressionist painters. So later on in her life, she was accused by people who found her writing incomprehensible of doing automatic writing. And she said, no, no, I don't, do, I don't do automatic writing because she knew that if she admitted to it that she would be branded, you know, as a kind of loony person rather than a serious artist. So she combined all her life, I believe, she combined automatic writing with serious critical work so that her books are by no means automatic writing, but it's as though she used that as a foundation 
for building up much more complex works of literature, which are, again, well worth reading. Now that piece, oh, you don't want Sorry. to talk about that piece. Sorry, I thought we... All right, I won't. It's fine. <laughs> no, no I'm just jumping so, fine. Just so I'm, I'm right. using <laughs> divided attention, I think. <laughs> okay, so in this piece, I've then got this, um, I found this wonderful little, um, it's a period between Art Deco and, and, and um, Art Nouveau, if you like, it's the period of Gertrude Stein. Um, it's a writing desk, and it's round. It, it, it's got a round back, and it's shaped like her because she was a very, very round person. Um, <laughs> Just on the back? A, yeah, both. I mean, there's a fantastic <laughs> statue of her in the uh, front of the New York Public Library, and she's sitting there like a, a little bronze Buddha because that's the shape she was. She's round, and so this is round. And the books in it are all books that refer to the practice of automatic writing. Some of the books are coming out of surrealism. Some are contemporary books. There are a lot of books now, interestingly enough, called How to Do Automatic Writing or Practice Automatic Writing and so forth. And then I've got, you know, some early volumes of um, William James, my mentioned. By the way, William James was Henry James's brother, you know, Henry James the writer. Anyway, so basically that's it. And on top of it, I've got a... Um, some things that I wrote explaining how I discovered that Gertrude Stein had done automatic writing because it's not very well known. And then I've got a copy of her BA thesis, which is on automatic writing, and a copy of her MA thesis, which was auto also on automatic writing, and that's in there along with some other material. Mm. Um, is this designed to be used like a bookshelf or to be looked at like an exhibit? No, it's not a bookshelf. You can't take them out. Um, they're all threaded on metal poles so that they're, it's one unit. So it's more about the idea of the It's about the idea. It's the about the seeing, books. you know, really asking the question about the history of automatism, which is a denigrated and mm. a, a denigrated history and how that relates to these other things that some of these books go into, which is on the one hand, philosophy, what is the nature of the self, who is the person, what is an artist, what is in, where do ideas come from, et cetera, et cetera, all around the theme that's raised by the practice of automatism. So, yeah, this isn't um, the only, um, as you mentioned, there's, uh, there's several other artists that you've made homage yeah. to, um, and we've got, got some of them in slides here. So, um, Marcel Duchamp. Um, and Eve Klein, which is, is my favourite. This actually. one, yeah. There's a detail, it there's a detail well. of that one because oh, that, that's yeah. a, that's crucial, yeah. isn't it? Yes. Well, these are all um, um, homage, homages to artists that I um, I admire and respect, and modernist artists who were, of course, and are considered to be among the very most important artists for our references at the moment and connecting that idea of greatness with the popular flowering of, of practices that relate very much to these artists. For example, you all know Eve Klein's Leap into the Void. Yeah, the famous photograph of him uh, appearing, appeal, appearing to throw himself off a building in a sort of flying posture. And that's often cited as a, a perfect picture of the aspiration of the artist. Eve Klein actually said he was practicing levitation. So that's what I've focused on. Mm. Again, this is a denigrated practice, a, a denigrated belief, but within modernism was taken up by artists who sort of often hid the source of their ideas because the ideas were discredited and made them the basis of a practice. So here we have, in my work, a, a collection that I've made of images from the internet of people um, purporting to show themselves in the act of lev levitation, as Eve Klein did. Um, I think it's very interesting now with Photoshop, you can do all this, but when Klein's photograph was produced, it was very carefully doctored by quite a famous photographer who had to do it all by hand. Um, and for a long time, people didn't know 
many people thought perhaps there was some truth to the fact that he had succeeded in flying rather than falling and killing himself. In fact, the, a lot of artists have attempted to imitate that. I know that um, Paul McCarthy in California apparently threw himself off the first floor of the art building <laughs> to try <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> to capture, and it's an idea of it, it's it's about failure and the relationship between failing and flying, if you like, um, from an artist's point of view, from the point of view of all these members of the public who aren't artists who like to show themselves um, flying. I think it expresses an aspiration for a notion of the self, which is perhaps more spiritual, more ethereal, more transcendent. Um, I actually find them very moving, although they're also very funny, some of the pictures. I particularly like the levitating cowboy. And, you know, why would somebody want to show themselves online in this way? Mm -hmm. It's absolutely fascinating, and it's very, very widespread. So that piece is called Homage to Eve Klein. Mm -hmm. well, I think we all know the image that it yeah. relates yeah. to. Would you ever consider making uh, work in homage to a living artist? Um, Jamie asks. Probably not. Okay. So we'll, we'll move on um, to it monuments. <laughs> I mean, that would be more like you a love letter, wouldn't it, than an homage, you know? <laughs> okay. Um, and just to tie the homage series with Monument, um, uh, this question is, um, memory and the act of remembrance features heavily in your work mm. from both series. It, um, is your work driven by the fear of death? Ooh. Well, all of us as artists are driven by the fear of death. That's why we make art. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that. And if you don't acknowledge the fear of death, then you're really living a very silly life because, unfortunately, it always ends badly. <laughs> and I think um, fear is a bad, of course, a bad negative sort of word in this context. I think trying to acknowledge the reality of death is what I mm. would like to think my work was doing. But I know that, you know, all the kinds of things that I do have been called by psychoanalysts and theorists uh, ways of warding off death. I mean, I'm sure you all are aware of that. That's what art is about. So let them talk about fear. I would rather just talk about, you know, acknowledging death. But this particular piece is explicitly about um, death in the sense of people who've died, it's a, it's a series of work, it's a series of photographs based on commemorative plaques to people who died in the act of trying to save someone else from dying. So it's extremely interesting in that regard. And another thing that's very curious about it is that none of the people were successfully rescued. So everybody who's mentioned in these plaques died, both the person who was drowning or caught on fire or something died, and also the rescuer died. It's a very um, sort of late Victorian, uh, Edwardian notion of heroism that's commemorated in these plucks, which in fact are found, the originals are found in a park in London near the Barbican. It's called uh, Postman's Park. And when I first went to the park, it was completely derelict, which was why I took the photographs, um, because I wanted to make sure that I had images of them uh, in this park that was clearly falling apart. Now, someone seems to either donated some money or someone has decided to fix up the park, and it really looks very nice now. Originally, the plaques were commissioned and paid for by... Uh, you know the painter Watts, you know Watts, the famous hmm, Victorian painter of big allegorical paintings like Hope. No, you don't know one. Okay. Well, um, he and his wife set up in, I think it's Woking, but it's at Surrey, they set up a arts and crafts uh, factory, tiles, 
to make these fabulous tiles, beautiful, beautiful tiles, and that's what these original plaques are made of. Um, and then, of course, I've made a sound tape, so you sit on the bench listening to the sound tape, which is a kind of meditation on uh, heroism and death and so forth. And then when people come into the space, they see this live, living, living person against this backdrop which commemorates dead people, and that's part of the way the work operates, I think. That you, if you sit and listen, you don't have one with the person on the bench. Uh, unfortunately, not. No. no. Well, if there were a person on the bench, you wouldn't see that the person is listening through headphones, um, and the kind of thing that you would normally do in private becomes a, pro a public performance. So that that is part of the work that you're invited to participate in that sense if you want to become part of the installation, or else. You don't need to, you can just look at the mm. wall part. Mm. Uh, Jamie was a bit cheeky. I think it's because I'm asking the questions rather than him. He's um, asked, how would you like to be remembered? I, I thought I'd put that in the middle because um, <laughs> it's a bit of a downer to finish on, isn't it? So <laughs> you don't have to ask. I don't know, it's like one of those questions in the mag newspaper or magazine. If your house were on fire, what would you rescue? You know, it, How would you like to be remembered? I don't care whether I remember it or not, actually. I mean, I won't be here to know, will I? So, <laughs> But obviously, no, seriously, all artists must, and I, of course, include myself, must have an intense desire to be remembered because, you know, one way or another, the work lives on, uh, even if it's just pieces of paper. You know, it's going to be there longer than you are. Mm -hmm. mm. Definitely. So um, just moving on to the Freud Museum, a lot of the students um, wanted to talk about archives. Um, and you've worked extensively with archives, either found or constructed by you. Um, and Jung here asks, I wonder whether she incorporates accidents in these archive works, and if so, how? How much is planned, and is there space for the unexpected or spontaneity or being lost? Well, I don't think I quite understand the question, so the answer I give, I apologize to whoever. Um, first of all... I guess the question's about I, how, how much you anticipate from the outset. You know, how I don't anticipate anything from the outset, but the, what is the outset? I mean, hmm. what is the, where does something begin? I actually began to put things into boxes. You can't see close up, so, okay, here we go. I began to put things into boxes at a period in, in my life when I had absolutely no invitations to do shows. I had no uh, plans to make any big works. I can't do a big work unless someone offers me a big space. No one was offer offering me a space. So I began to put things that interested me, not just interested me, but fascinated me. Um, into boxes, into the way that we all do when you want to save something, you know. Everybody has a box of things, little things usually, and those, then when you bring the things out of the box, it reminds you of something. There's a set of associations with that. So that's how my piece began. I would have, for example, the 45 record there. That, or there, wherever you're looking at it. Um, I had held on to that for years. Okay, the time had come to think about why was I holding on to that record. And since we're talking about death, this is very appropriate. The record is a song called Look Homeward Angel. Look Homeward Angel is also a book by uh, Thomas Wolfe, and the angel that he's referring to in the book is actually an angel in a graveyard. So the whole idea of home has to do with death, the ultimate home, and there's all these metaphors in our language and our literature about that. So this is very simple. I got a picture of um, death as the Grim Reaper and put it together with the record. And then I gave it a title. Now, I don't know what I gave that. What is the title on that? Uh, I've got the book here, but um, we could have a look through. But well, it has a name. A so it one. has a name which would refer to this supposed insight that I came up with. And it also has, it also oh, has nice. a classification, a very dry classification, a kind of uh, museum-type classification, like it would say uh, assorted, contextualized, organized, one of those kind of words, and then the date. 
So that is a good example of how the different units were um, made. I don't know what else I can say and ask the question about accident. No, but it is in there situation, someplace. But if anybody I wants to check, we've got two called, copies of this in the library. Heimlich. It may be called Heimlich. It is called Heimlich. Heimlich um, is a German word. It means uh, home. And I was using it in the sense that Freud used it because, of course, this piece was based on a residency that I did in the Freud Museum. The whole idea of free association, which I was doing with these objects, is one that Freud more or less invented. Um, he used the word unheimlich to mean the uncanny. And I use the word heimlich because although it means home, actually in German it also means the same as unheimlich, which is very curious because if you look in a German dictionary, you'll see that it says heimlich, home, homelike, homely, then it goes into secret, secretive, you know, it sort of shades off into some bad things that might happen in the home. So I use the word Heimlich to evoke Freud's idea of the uncanny. I, I really like this, um, the piece of the, um, which is the Outlaw. The outlaw um, Cowgirl, I like it. And it became another piece afterwards. Yeah. Um, I, re I thought I liked it too. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is it's actually one of my questions, so I've managed to sneak in here. Um, and I, I'm really interested in the recurring themes and objects that appear and reappear throughout your practice. And I think as artists we all find it difficult to finish works. And yep. I just wondered when you considered a work to be finished. No, I don't. That's a terribly difficult question. I know, when is anything ever finished? Yeah, well, that's I mean, it. And I, I think the way that you've reworked this piece from... Um, well, I thought this piece deserved to come out of the box yeah, because I yeah. liked it too. Um, this started off with a cow that I had, which was uh, a milk jug with a cow. And um, I had kept that for a long time. I think I had been given that when I was a child or something, and I had it. And it, it only, when I started to think about it, I realized how peculiar it was. Because you see, our society, like every other society in the world, is busy making things all, you know, all the time. And we just say, oh, it's just a thing. You know, it's not anything. But of course, it means something. And so we like to think more about things from other societies than we do about our own. I was looking at this cow and thinking, what in the world is so bizarre? It's a cow. And yet, to get the milk out of it, the milk comes out of its mouth. It's vomiting milk. This is really horrible. <laughs> It's a horrible, horrible thing. And um, then I realized that the, one of the reasons that I had some association with this cow was that I had never heard the derogatory term for women. I'd never heard a woman called a cow until I came here. This is not something we use it's in the United about States. Britain. Yeah, yeah, it's a British <laughs> term. We have lots of horrible words. I mean, bitch, that's a female mm -hmm. dog, you know. But cow is very, very English. I don't know if it's British, it's English. And um, so then I got angry and I got this picture um, of a woman outlaw in the United States because in those days all the outlaws, you know, when they were arrested, there's a sort of glamour to it, like the James brothers and so forth. They had pictures, they had photographs taken of themselves or the newspapers took pose them, you know, in, in formal poses for big articles and booklets and things that were written about them. This was a woman cowgirl, and she put on a really nice dress, and then she had her hat, and best of all, she had a gun. And this was perfect in the Freud Museum, this gun, um, which as you all know is a phallic symbol, supposedly. Although Freud did say a cigar is sometimes just a cigar because he was a cigar smoker, so I guess a gun could sometimes <laughs> just be a gun. But it seemed to me it was an interesting thing to put this aggressive woman in her nice dress in relationship to these very peculiar things which I now saw as being completely abject, these cows. And of course, I, I made an enormous collection of cows. I have a huge collection. I still haven't really finished that piece mm. with the cows. Mm. Um, I mentioned earlier, though, quite a few questions about feminism. Um, 
I, I can just read the three questions yeah, sure. that I've picked out. Um, how do you relate your practice with gender studies and can you describe feminism of today from your experience? Would you describe yourself as a feminist? And um, this is a slightly different angle. Are there still barriers to working as a female artist today? Well, I'm in no particular order. Yes, of course, I'm a feminist. B, uh, gender studies, I don't relate to gender studies. I'm, I don't know how to explain this. I would never base my work on the work of another discipline. So gender studies is doing its work, I'm doing my work. If we overlap, so much the better, okay? So that's my answer to that part of it. But um, are there still difficulties? Yeah, of course there are tremendous difficulties. First of all, there are personal difficulties, psychological difficulties, and there are social difficulties. Um, it's obvious there are. I mean, we're still having lots and lots and lots of exhibitions that are primarily men, although as Sarah and I have discussed, most art students now are women, but it doesn't seem to change uh, very much the distribution of uh, numbers of artists who are participating on a professional level. On the other hand, something extremely positive, some of the most famous artists are women now. Some of the most successful artists are women. So the kind of problems that I experienced of not feeling there were any good you know, prototypes or role models, surely um, you know, don't, that shouldn't apply anymore to anyone who's female. I mean, I didn't discover a role model until I discovered Louise Bourgeois, and she was practically 90 by that time, you know. But she wasn't well known at all while I was growing up. I mean, she was really not, not a known artist. She didn't become known until she was very, very old. And that is something interesting that, that, that you might um, think about, is why is it that women artists tend to be recognized early when they are very attractive young women and then go through a very long slump until they get older um, <laughs> when they are fierce old dragons or whatever it is that fits into <laughs> no that fits into the cultural stereotype but in between it's very very difficult so there is a pattern that needs to be broken and hopefully you know it will be broken by your generation yeah yeah um, if we go on to talk about the last silent movie, um, could you discuss the relationship between the absent image and the isolated voice um, in this work, and how you came to use subtitles as a means of communicating the language? Well, the subtitles don't communicate the language. The subtitles translate the language into our language. And I believe that that <clears throat> probably raises questions, which may be what that question is actually about, raises questions of what's actually being communicated by the translation. It's, it's not so much the text of the translation that interests me, it's what the voice is communicating, which is separate from our being able to literally understand the language. So you have these two things happening at once. You have the physicality, the reality, if you like, of the voice, and then you have its translation into English. Um, and the piece is built up on that, so it's not how did I come to use subtitles. I mean, I use subtitles, that's part of the work. Um, because that gap um, stands for quite a lot uh, in terms of our relationship to others and our understanding of what's conveyed through the physical. And I have to go into something here about sound. <clears throat> Unlike um, visual, uh, unlike visual, um, unlike, no. listening is different than seeing because listening is physical. You hear a sound literally in your ears. The sound is vibrating against your eardrums. Seeing is always at a distance. I'm sure you all know all this. It's been theorized quite a lot. Now, seeing is at a distance. Listening is like touch. It's actually experiencing sound 
that's coming from someplace else. So when it's the voice of another person, that person is touching you in some way. It's, it's real. Okay? That's what this piece is really attempting to do. So I didn't want to show images because I wanted the voices of the speakers to communicate with each person in the audience physically. I hope that answers that question. Yeah. I think it does think exceptionally it, yeah. well, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, we move on to talk about witness. <coughs> this is yeah. uh, one of my all-time favorite works, artworks ever, ever in the world. <laughs> 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 and it's for a variety of reasons. Firstly, the execution of the work, so beautiful. Um, the impact of the presence of the work is really striking, and it's wonderfully emotive. And it embodies what you do so well with, within a truth to materials. The mechanism of the sound is on display and the suspended speakers hover like a multitude of spacecraft, illuminated by a single light. Actually, when I was 14, I saw a UFO. Um, so this has an extra yeah. resonance, an extra meaning for me. And that, that experience, it was just a light in the sky. It wasn't particularly yeah. exciting, but what was exciting was when the radio, the local radio, the next day said there'd been oh, really? these sightings that couldn't be explained. Could anybody right. phone up if they've seen it? So I did. And my testimony, I felt, was, was what made it real, made it concrete. Um, did you keep a recording? I think I might have a little cassette yeah. somewhere. I should have played it. But we've got the recordings of uh, a couple of the people here, which I thought were great. My name is Jason. On Thursday, January 13th, 2000, my uncle and I were returning to Adelaide from a fishing trip when we noticed three pinkish red objects travelling in vertical formation. The lowest object was slightly behind the other two. At first, the UFOs were apparently stationary, with the lowest object showing intermittent random pulsing. The distance between the objects was approximately four fingers at arm's length, and they held formation for the first ten minutes of our 20 minute observation. During the next 10 minutes, the upper two objects faded, and the lowest lighted object started to skip upwards and then return to its original position. This was done four times at approximately every 2.5 minutes. I am a qualified pilot. I estimated the speed of this object to be approximately 200 feet per second. The bottom light was approximately 30 degrees above the horizon. It was lost from our sight when it moved behind a large cloud. I love the fact he's a pilot, because you think it's, it's got to be real, it's got to have happened. And then there's another one which is a bit funnier that I thought would um, be quite nice to Where did you on. get them? They're good and clear. They're from your, um, from your oh, book, from the, yeah. which is in yeah. the library, Yeah, you've got uh, with a CD. You can listen to all of them on there. I've listened to a lot of them. I was with my third year old son in my lobby on Rome Hill Street in Bradford when we saw what seemed to be a human being about 1.2 metres high, dressed in skin tight black clothes. It held its arms close to its side, its feet close together, and walked by a series of jumps. On its chest was a silver disc, perforated with holes. It turned off suddenly and was lost to sight. We were too amazed and shocked to follow after it. <laughs> so, where, where did you find people like that? <laughs> Well, they're everywhere. You're, here you are. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm extremely interested in all these fringe phenomena because... Um, keeps going off. Because I think that uh, all, all cultures are as much of a, a sort of a prison as they are, you know, of benefit. And there are all sorts of things that we think of as being completely impossible, weird, stupid, embarrassing even. This is embarrassing to, you know, uh, that have at other times and in other places had explanations that were quite respectable. A lot of the um, sightings of the UFOs in particular resemble descri earlier descriptions of, you know, heavenly beings like angels and so forth because there's always a light, a phenomenon of light, or some special light effect, um, which seem, m makes it clear to me at least that the description of whatever this is changes, you know, according to what sort of uh, 
experience would be considered more acceptable. So nowadays, a sort of scientific uh, explanation is quite often given. We don't say angels as much as we say UFOs. And I, I find this very, very interesting. Now, some of the people, there's more than 300 of them, are perhaps slightly delusional. Uh, others are giving reports in a very factual way because they had to give these reports. If they reported it to the police or something like that, then they have a very factual description. Sometimes they just told their friends and they wrote it down, you know, and so forth and so on. It's very interesting. Um, and they're numerous. They're numerous and they're from all over the world and in witness they're speaking in many different languages because I don't think there's a, any place in the world that hasn't had these sorts of occurrences, some of which are reported and most of them I assume probably aren't. Because some people feel that it's a very embarrassing thing to admit that you've seen this. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> recently, recently, I think it was Jordan Baseman had uh, some films you may have seen. They showed fairly recently, and they, he had. <clears throat> I think the story is he has a residency, I believe, at Cambridge, and so he asked some uh, academics from Cambridge to participate in his project. And they were really supposed to be talking about death and melancholy and mourning, and one person talked about uh, leprechauns that she'd seen. No, no, seriously. And this person is a university lecturer, highly regarded, has not told lots of people about it, but she saw something that she does not know how else to describe it. And uh, so we're all laughing at the man and his talking about the person hopping, the being hopping down the street in a black suit with a <clears throat> plaque around its neck of some sort, amulet. Um, but another person might call that a leprechaun or a fawn or something. And what is it? Who knows? We don't know. I prefer to believe that all the people telling these stories are telling what they believe is truthful. I don't think they're telling the stories to impress anybody, particularly. So when people ask me if I believe in UFOs, I have to tell them I don't know whether I believe in them because I've never seen one. But I know that the people telling these stories believe in UFOs because they've seen them. It doesn't solve the paradox of the level of reality that you can attribute to the phenomenon. <clears throat> I suppose that's why I wanted to make the work in a form that had a kind of seductive element to it because I wanted people who, in the audience, to feel drawn in to the extent that listening to these stories in their ear might lead them to picture something. And once you begin to picture it, then you have an imaginative connection to it. And then when you leave, you can say, no, 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 I don't believe in that. But still, you know, there might be something. Mm. And that's my attitude. There might be something. I don't know what it is. Um, I've got a good question to kind of round up with. I've had to skip a lot of questions because yeah. you've answered so thoroughly all well, the way through. Um, but hopefully, I don't know if we'll, we'll have a little bit of time for questions that might have come <laughs> up. But um, I thought this was a really good, good one to finish up on. That, that you've got numerous publications. You give lectures in many cities. And um, it's Young He who's asked this. I wonder what the role the narrative of the artist plays in your practice and in the viewer's experience of your work. Mm. Well, I don't like to give talks very much, and I really don't do them anymore. And this but is different. Well, thank you for yeah. it. No, this is different because yeah. it's a different kind of situation. And I used to teach at the Slate, and it's very nice to be back, and so forth and so on. Um, because I think that you can be the victim of your own past. I think it was Adrian Searle, wasn't it, who said something like, because he edited a book of artists talking about their work, and he actually said in the introduction to this book, which is published by the ICA here in London, that you should never believe anything an artist said. But here he was <laughs> doing this book. Never believe anything an artist says about his or her own work because the artist can only talk about it truthfully from your own point of view. You can't interpret it for anybody else, and yet artists are constantly being asked, one way or another, to narrate their work, to explain it, to say what it means. And it's not possible to do that. And I don't like the fact that I have often somehow found myself in the position where I've done it. 
and I think I really shouldn't do it anymore. That's my answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got, well, we got an exclusive. Because, then. you know, let me just to go a little bit further th than this, I mean, <clears throat> there is a style for artists to be asked, because everyone's interested in art, and artists are paradoxical, and artists don't even understand the work of other artists very, very well. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we often have opportunities to listen to an artist talking about his or her work, and they show their images, and they tell you something about it, and gradually we build up a picture in which we think we know something. Well, you don't know anything, really. The only way you can know anything about a work is to be in a relationship with that work, without anything between you and the work. And then you will know what it means for you, and that's it. There's no more than that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, can you cope with a couple more questions? Have we got any yeah, extra time? Difficult. difficult. <laughs> no, these are very difficult questions, and I feel like I've been, I don't know. No, you've answered them wonderfully. It's oh, um, very nice, but it's... Oh, do we have to finish there? Or? Is that it? Are we off for time? Yes, I, I am. I saw somebody had their hand up at the back, was obviously longing to say something. That has, doesn't have to be a maybe, question. Maybe we could just get yeah a couple of comments or one or two. Oh, no. No, okay. <laughs> I want to try. No, if there aren't any, that's fine. That's I mean, I've, I've got plenty more, but I think we've, we've got kind of... We've probably okay. wrapped up. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you for being such a good audience.